When it comes to fitness, we've always looked for the new way, new trend that will make us feel, look, and live better. We're pulled to workouts that ironically don't look like a lot of work. People want to go to the gym and have fun. And I played this formula, amazing music. We also bought into workouts that clearly don't work. Like a dumbbell that you like shook. I can't stop giggling. Or the thigh master, right? There's so many fads that like were flops. And today, we pay to be pushed to our limits. HIIT training is quick, it's fast, it fits into their lifestyle. Our need to sweat up a storm fuels an almost 97 billion US dollar fitness industry. And the businesses that are coming out on top are the ones who can give us results better and faster. Here's a trunk stretching exercise to strengthen the nut muscles. <clears throat> Note the well-developed body. <laughs> to show you how to feel better and look better so you can live longer. This is the fitness frenzy that's taking over the world. It now boasts more than 1,700 studios globally in just over a decade. It's pretty hard to, to grow any faster than we've grown. This is Rob Deutsch, founder of global fitness community F45. For many years, I was working in finance and I thought about launching something like F45 and I deliberated and deliberated. And when I finally made the decision to go out and do it, I was the happiest person on earth. I wanted to create something that was fun, energetic, super innovative workouts where clients could literally come, make friends and feel part of the community. I would say if there's one word to sum up F45, I think it's probably comprehensive. This is David Levesley, a fitness and culture journalist who's tried out and written about every possible workout there is. I don't have to think about going to a gym, going to other classes. I get my cardio and my strength. If you come enough times a week and you are devoted enough to it, you will, you will be fitter. F45 is today's greatest hit franchise, otherwise known as high intensity interval training. It's made up of uncompromising, strenuous bursts of physical activity. The silver lining, it's over in 45 minutes. Fitness professionals have voted it one of the top regiments seven years in a row. And it contributes to a global health and fitness industry that sees 184 million members and nearly 210,000 facilities worldwide. In Asia, South Korea holds the record for the largest number of gyms. China takes the lead with the highest number of members. Singapore, one of the smallest countries in the world, ranks top globally in annual revenue generated per member. There's clearly a demand to hit it hard at the gym. But why is it that we love to work out? I just like to move around and uh, sweat out. You know, working out gives your body a sense of endorphin. I feel strong and it's like a reboot for my brain. Having that routine, I feel like it really sets you up for a good day. I don't work out, but look at these babies now, I'm just joking. Love it or hate it, we all know that working out is essential to our health. And it's not surprising that this dates back to the dawn of man. But let's go forward to a time we can actually relate to. The Roaring Twenties. People cared more for festivities over fitness, and the vibrating belt was the rage. The 1930s. The Women's League of Health and Beauty got women doing leg lifts, star jumps, and toe touches en masse. You can easily persuade your husband or brother to catch the ball while he's shaving. Women's fitness has always been tied to beauty standards. This is Professor Katie Rose Hamanek, cultural anthropologist, author, and Olympic weightlifter. In the 1950s and 60s, women weren't necessarily out of the house working like men were. It's about, are you slim still for your husband? With industrial capitalism, suburb proliferation, people started having also convenient appliances. This setup makes any day wash day for me. Couldn't be easier. And so that kind of came through the television. The golden age of the telly gave rise to this man, the godfather of modern fitness. 
I'm gonna show you how you can firm up your bust line, how you can take down your waist and firm up your hips, how you can get rid of those ugly pounds, all of these things from me to you. Jack LaLanne brought workouts to American homes for the first time. So muscles became very in style in the 80s and 90s. Terminator movies and Rambo movies and all these movies where the protagonist was sort of this giant man with all these muscles. And we also have the fitness queen. Jane Fonda, step aerobics goddess, who made aerobic wear on Vogue. They have this image that is like, this is what fitness looks like. Well, how do I look like that? Well, I buy Arnold Schwarzenegger's book. I buy Jane Fonda's VHSs so that I can also build a body that looks like that. Propelled by pop culture, aerobics naturally became a worldwide fitness craze. It was so popular that Singapore in 1993 launched a national aerobics fitness routine called the Great Singapore Workout. And it was aerobics that set the stage for the next workout trend, dancing your way to fitness. He wanted to call it Woomba, Woomba. but it sounded like, like pregnancy workout. <laughs> Alberto, Alberto say Zumba. We all loved it immediately. These are the co-founders of Zumba, one of the biggest fitness trends in modern memory. And they all happen to be called Alberto. The first Alberto, or Beto, is the creative genius who invented Zumba. It was an accident. One day, uh, I, I come to the gym and I forgot my music. And the only music that I had with me was a cassette, but different kind of music. Latin, salsa, cumbia, reggaeton. Inside to me, I was shaking my legs because, because I know I need to improvise for one hour. Thanks to this accident, I create Zumba. Enter Alberto number two. I was at a family dinner and every single female in that room was speaking about Beto's class. My mom said, I'll introduce you to Beto's. I went to the class. Every single person in the class was smiling. Every single person. And that was really what impressed me. Now we are 20, 20 years together and is the best decision I take in my life. Alberto Aguillon makes up the final founding member. I thought it's risky, but I, I, I immediately connected with it and I understood the potential immediately. It's the time. It was 2001, Ricky Martin was singing Living La Vida Loca at the Grammys. Latin music was crossing over. J-Lo, Mark Anthony, Enrique Iglesias won the hearts of Americans, and Zumba wanted to be part of this crossover story. So it was obviously, how do we get the money and how do we get started? The first tape we ever did was to show it to potential investors. But not one investor caught the dance bug. The fitness industry laughed at us. Oh, you guys don't know what the industry is. You're Latin, you dance. It's a joke, what's the business there? But we knew, we knew there was something. There was lines of people trying to go to the Zumba class, so, so we said there has to be a way to scale this. I always loved staying up late and watching what people sold on television. Well, I remember there was an infomercial called Taibo, and it was kickboxing tapes that were being sold on TV. In that time, the only way to go direct to the consumer was via television. Their persistence paid off thanks to the late night television delights of the early 2000s. But hips and calves. OxyClean, the stain specialist. Infomercials grew into a business behemoth, growing into a 300 billion US dollar industry by 2009. I'm mixing all the ingredients together. You've got a beautiful homemade pasta sauce. It was an even bigger market than television itself. Next to magic potions to cure baldness and zany inventions like the slicer cum dicer, Zumba workout DVDs made their debut. You're guaranteed to lose a full dress or pants size in your first 10 days or your money back. The infomercial was a, a big deal. I was traumatized 
three months before we shoot in the video for my, because I need to speak English. And every day for two hours I went to, to learn and to, to, to try to memorize all these words. And it looked like I speak very good English, but I don't know really, really what I say in this time. Merengue, salsa, many rhythms in one class. So with infomercials, it was a pipeline into the living room. Kenneth Goh is an educator in strategic management at the Singapore Management University. If you want to reach across uh, the United States, infomercials was one of the best way uh, to do so. Now that said, uh, it's uh, limited. For a small company, they have to work through the, um, the direct uh, TV marketers. And these will be the people who are making the bulk of the money. Will they make a lot of money? Maybe not. Despite having good sales numbers through infomercials, Zumba only received a small portion in royalties from their direct TV marketer. The trio found themselves with little in the bank by the end of 2003. I was always looking for other opportunities. If it doesn't work, we're gonna go into medical billing. And when I told Perlman that, he freaked out and he said, no way. I remember this day, Alberto's boat, they tell me, you know what, Beto, I think this is it. And I feel like I, I will be alone. I say, I don't want. In this moment, coming a company, Kellogg's. To the rescue, Tony the Tiger in 2003. The company wanted an effective way to bring their cereals to the Latin market. The strategy, to put a Zumba DVD in every cereal box as part of a health and fitness campaign. Tony the Tiger is like a superhero. He needs to be dynamic, very cool. And I say, you know what, guys? Give me this custom. And the CEO said, I want to do three more projects. Kept us going for a couple years. Yeah. Every time there was something that saved Zumba. Every time. It was inevitable. From 2004 to 2007, over 3 million DVDs were redeemed or sold in this partnership that resulted in record-breaking sales. Their popularity surged alongside the entire fitness industry. Close to 33 million Americans signed up to fitness in the year 2000. This increased by 52% to 50 million a decade later. Fast forward to the 2010s. The fitness scene was defined by the likes of the fitness influencer, wearable technology, diet tribes like keto, vegan, paleo, the list goes on, and the it trend that still persists still today high-intensity interval training, or HIT. Got into F45 pretty early on in Singapore, five years ago. This is Mel Cassidy, fitness trainer and business owner of three F45 studios in Singapore. There are various studies to show that, that HIT training is effective, you know, in as little as 30 minutes. They're looking for cost-effective, dynamic, and also results-driven workouts. The F in F45 stands for functional workouts. It's a type of strength training that readies your body for day-to-day -day activities. Pricier than a gym, but cheaper than hiring a personal trainer, F45 sits at a $45 a week fee and promises PT-like results. This workout was founded in 2013 by former equities trader Rob Deutsch, and personal trainer Luke Istamine. One thing that I really realised was normal commercial gyms where people arrive with their earphones on, with no community basis, where they don't make friends and they don't get an experience from their workouts, was really dying. And the average attendance around the world for normal commercial gyms is once a month. So I found that there was a fundamental flaw in gymnasium businesses where people were signing up for their memberships and not arriving. There's a research on how people relate in gyms and it was mostly about politeness and about greeting people, but you didn't build any kinds of friendships. F45 sort of tap into this new branding market. We're gonna tap into the social media um, organizing and we're gonna tap into this desire to do high intensity training. And we're just gonna build this community based on this brand and F45 needed that competitive advantage. There was the CrossFit cult already dominating the market. Stationary biking that got everyone spinning. 
And since fitness fads have a way of coming and going, F45 needed to build a concept that would stick. Modern life has a way of making us feel time crunched and pressured. Our hectic schedules call for a time efficient way to burn calories. And high intensity interval training hits our spot. A yearly survey conducted by the American College of Sports Medicine has seen HIT remain in the top five for the past seven years. We like this idea of if we're doing an exercise, that means scientifically that I'm burning more calories and there's sort of an element of redemption and sacrifice. I have to suffer for it to be working. If I'm not suffering, it's not working. And that sort of taps into like elite sports ideologies. And we all aspire to the athleticism of the pros, which is what makes HIT so attractive, even back in the 1900s. The interval training system was used to help Olympic runners improve strength and stamina through bursts of short sprints. It helped this Finnish man, Pavo Normi, bag 22 world records and nine Olympic golds. And since then, world-renowned fitness regimens like F45 have people hooked on the workout en masse. Clients that burn, you know, upwards of 700 calories in 45 minutes. So you don't need any longer than that. You've just got to be smart the way you train and you shouldn't need any longer than 45 minutes. It's quick, it's fast, it fits into their lifestyle. Air conditioned space, variety, tech. It was trendy. They love a good trend. It was very Instagrammable. They love that. It's got a great presence on social media. So I think there was a huge transformation in the late 2000s. First of all, we have smartphones. And with that proliferation of social media, people started to think of themselves as brands. You're buying into one particular kind of strategy that you think is going to make you fit and make you look good. This is what F45 members buy into. It's a studio space with no frills, but heavily optimized. When a member walks into a studio, the trainers literally click the screens on and the session runs for only 45 minutes. All exercises are preloaded, sent out from HQ to every single studio around the world. Lionheart heart rate monitors, helps the trainers be able to know when to push, when to not push so hard if they're already at their maximum heart rate. It also sends a member uh, a report directly after the workout. Now, if you look at your typical gyms, when you see the TV monitors, it sort of entice them to sign up because of such a wonderful experience that they're going to get by coming to the gym. So F45 flips that on its head as well by using the TV monitors as feedback for how hard you're working. F45 is tapping on our need to know more of ourselves through numbers. We're enumerating and auditing ourselves through numbers to, to tabulate you know, how fit we are. And this is sort of like quasi-science culture. It's Fitness practices really like to kind of talk about it as empirical or as um, science-based, um, but really what it is is that makes them feel like, oh, this is more uh, quantifiable, therefore it's more meaningful. And while personalization is important, there's another factor that F45 knew it had to cultivate. Jenny, high five. Excellent. When you have a strong community, that retains members. We host events like Christmas parties, you know, go for a walk on the green corridor. You know, things that aren't actually specifically an F45 class, but they are community uh, bonding type events. These sort of secular spaces provided some of the sort of community that religion and religious institutions had already provided, you know, for centuries. It's like a space to like be yourself and find yourself and find your friends. F45 fueled the growth of their community through the launch of an eight-week challenge. 
And I have done maybe like seven challenges. The right way to ever inspire anybody to keep going is progress pictures or like real world objective games, like dropping a jean size, dropping a dress size. But the way that they make you reframe looking at progress is looking at progress pictures instead of looking at the scales is actually one of the many ways that they have improved my relationship with exercise fundamentally. Instagram and Facebook became the fitness buddy holding you accountable. And if you didn't track it or share it online, it's like Intuit never happened. But dial it back to a time where social media didn't exist. How did fitness trends build community? This was what Zumba in 2003 needed to figure out. Fans were flocking to get physical with Zumba. Zumba DVDs hit record-breaking sales. But this level of response isn't surprising. We've seen it with shake weights, with thigh buster. And before you know it, it becomes a fad. Zumba needed to break this cycle. For many years, whenever we attended fitness trade shows, there was always something new. And someone would come up to us and said, this is the last year of Zumba, you know, this is it. Like, Zumba's done. I mean, everybody already did it. We decided that we needed to have a sustainable, a recurring business model. And we started trying to come up with the idea of how do you train people to deliver a Zumba experience? And we decided, without knowing anything about fitness education, that we were going to write a manual of how to teach Zumba. And then we held our first instructor training. We were in for 20, 30 people, and it's coming like 120 people. They came from all over the country. In just two years, Beto had trained roughly 700 Zumba instructors, who then went on to hold their own classes around the world. We decided that we needed to have a sustainable sort of relationship with them uh, that was longer term and provide them with everything they need to, to be successful. And that's when we came up with the Zumba Instructor Network in 2005. This is the crystallized business model that would give Zumba the scale it needed. Turn instructors into entrepreneurs to power the brand forward. In 2006, the Zumba Instructor Network, or ZIN, was created. Hopeful trainers would pay a low monthly membership fee and be provided with a certification course and marketing and class materials, like music and new choreography. All the sweat they poured into their business, the profits were theirs to keep. So the instructors are everything to us. They are the ones who carry the Zumba message. We wanted instructors to be free. It's like open source software. So if an instructor wanted to teach free Zumba classes in the jungle of Chiang Mai, who are we to stop them? We don't even want to call it a company, it's a movement. Armed with a profitable business model and a rapidly growing army of certified ambassadors, Zumba was ready for the global stage. Twenty ten, the year that brought us the first iPad, Uber, One Direction, and Zumba hits fever pitch in America. The dance movement's network of instructors grew by 4,000% from 2007 to 2010 across the United States. And the Zumba party wasn't stopping there. One person from another country came to one of our instructor trainings and said, oh, this would be huge in Italy. Why don't you bring it to Italy? Beto flew to Italy and we started training instructors in Italy and that's how it happened. And one thing led to the other and we started expanding across Europe. I was the only one I make the trainings, but it was so hard for me because I teach 22 classes for a week. I didn't stop. The most hard moment for my ego was when Alberto told me, Beto, we need to find a person help you to teach other instructor, but I need to trust them. Everybody have your own uh, country, your territory. They need to work in your own language. It was the only way to grow. I, I need to accept it. It was only a matter of time before Zumba would come to Asia's shores 
and it was going to take more than just zealous instructors for Zumba to find its feet in this market. There are so many different languages in Asia, and we didn't know how we were going to get all the information across. But one of the beautiful things of Zumba is that in a Zumba class, nobody speaks. It's very important that people hear the music and feel the music. I don't know, it's magic when I teach my classes. I feel connected with everybody there. Zumba didn't rely on just Beto's well-choreographed visual cueing system. In order to get the party started offshore, they diversified. They adapted their music to cater to local tastes. And Beto was Zumba's guru on the ground. Philippines are crazy. They are like a Latinos from there. They are, I was in Beijing, a lot of young people. The stage is like a concert with lights and everything. Whereas I was in, in Japan, everybody synchronized. So I want to cry. 12,000 people singing and singing in Spanish. I have amazing memories. I remember like five countries in 12 days. In 2017 alone, Beto traveled to 30 countries spanning from Russia to Japan, leading thousands in concert-like master dance classes. I need to sleep in the, in the plane to Beijing to Malaysia, I think. When I land in, I need to directly to the gym to teach a training. 200 instructors waiting for me, conference, TV, all these things, happy face. And I say, oof, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. But it was an amazing experience because it was my first time. I love, I love the culture of the uh, different countries in Asia. I love it. Aquí estamos en, <laughs> haciendo desorden en Japón, que todo es ordenado. Los venezolanos, los colombianos haciendo este desorden y el otro colombiano allá detrás. Today, Zumba has over 200 Zumba education specialists around the world, training new instructors every week. No other fitness brand in the world reaches 15 million people. We're in 200,000 locations. That's more than McDonald's, Starbucks, and Dunkin' Donuts combined. Zumba was on its way to becoming a global fitness empire. But as their popularity grew, so did a large problem, piracy. We couldn't stop it. So what we decided to do was, in our new set of DVDs, we put messages that said, go find a Zumba class, go find a live Zumba class. We won't make money on those DVDs, but we will help all our instructors get their classes uh, full. Uh, but we've also had to deal with instructor piracy in many, many different countries. And usually with a strong letter uh, from a lawyer to the gym, that instructor either leaves or becomes legally trained in Zumba. Zumba is constantly plagued with lawsuits. Worse, it looked like Zumba was peaking. It fell out of the top 20 worldwide fitness trends in 2014. And by 2017, Zumba fell to number 39 and remained there in 2018. Right at the thick of it all, a titanic shift in fitness was happening. Work increasingly became more fast-paced. The working adult, time poor. Because it's not worth doing if you're not going a lot, like financially and fitness-wise, so you need somewhere that's near to you. In London, in particular, um, F45 has franchised quite quickly. I live in South London, and there's probably seven different South London F45s. Um, so you, I mean, you could do a lot of trials. You could do a lot of trials at those <laughs> for not much money. <laughs> F45's model makes it ripe for franchising. Free from the shackles of lockers, showers, and elaborate equipment, setup and labor costs are lower. One franchise would sell at about 35,500 US dollars a pop. Franchisees then have to purchase around 71,000 US dollars of equipment and pay a 1,000 US dollar monthly membership fee. It's a lot easier for you to break even for the entrepreneur to make money. The average uh, F45 gym has about 175 members and on the average uh, they only need uh, 75 members to break even. So the, the additional 100 members, that's pure profit that goes to the uh, 
uh, the gym owners. Fitness brands illustrate the McDonaldization of society. And it's this way of providing a brand, and then within that brand, you always know what you're going to get. The menu's the same, no matter where you go. So you kind of create this community that's not just about your local gym, but about sort of this international brand. Within two years, F45 grew from 15 studios to 500 studios in Australia and 750 around the world. According to Fast Company, it was dubbed one of the fastest growing fitness franchises in the world. Hollywood celebrity Mark Wahlberg, among other investors, pumped the fitness chain with investments to fuel expansion. So it's pretty hard to, to grow any faster than we've grown, but I don't think we ever imagined it would take off the way that it has. We obviously had grand plans to take this globally, but to be in 33 different countries and have sold a thousand franchises in four years, we never could have dreamed of that. Besides the cash injection, another key to F45's rapid expansion is its workout algorithm and patented technology-enabled delivery platform. The fitness programming algorithm shuffles through a playlist of 3,900 training movements, all displayed on televisions around the studio. One could go to F45 for years and never do the same workout twice. The TVs were probably the first of its kind. Every day, we have a different workout appearing on the screen. So you plug the dongle into the back of the TV and then from HQ, they are able to send the programming for each day to each specific studio around the world. So every F45 studio in the world will run the same program on the same day. Prior to F45, when I was running boot camps, I would spend 15 to 20 hours a week programming workouts. It was time consuming. So this takes that aspect out of it for the franchisee. You aren't going to be doing that workout again in, this, in the exact same way, but you still have enough consistency and enough of a like internal language that you can kind of know and get familiar with it as well. The near 4,000 exercises in F45's toolkit were performed by trainer Corey George over a two and a half month period in an LA warehouse. According to Deutsch, the algorithm shuffling through these moves is far smarter than any human and builds better workouts. And it took them two to three years with six trainers and a scientist to build. The beauty about the F45 algorithm is that it relies on your data and that's your history with F45 to generate that novelty. And so that algorithm uh, plays a very critical role in helping to retain customers but this tech novelty doesn't exempt fitness trends from losing customers. Right next to F45's meteoric rise was a growing pain, training-related injuries. This is part of a wider concern of how high-intensity training could hit us where it hurts. There were nearly 4 million injuries related to hit equipment and workouts over a nine-year period between 2007 to 2016. With the competitiveness of the workout, you're seeing a little bit more of an increase in, in injury because people are pushing themselves oftentimes beyond what their bodies are capable of. They have a, a movement and consistency that gets exacerbated by the thing that they're doing. People fall off because of injury. CrossFit, a once high-flying HIT regiment, started falling out from favor after multiple studies cautioned of the injury-prone workout. According to a study done by the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine, 30% of CrossFitters surveyed experienced an injury over the past year. Those with higher physical pursuits incurred more. F45 has both exacerbated my bad relationship with exercise and has also improved my relationship with exercise immeasurably. There are definitely injuries in exercise because the more we keep thinking we have to lift heavier and do harder things and push ourselves to athletic proportions, the more we are not recovering to athletic proportions either. But I do think that all exercise spaces need to think more about pastoral care for the people who go there. Despite the risks, demand for these techniques remained strong. F45's aggressive expansion plans were undeterred, 
entering 45 markets with 1,750 franchises by 2020. By having these videos that are an effectively wordless guide to a workout that just uses um, the visuals of working out, anybody anywhere in the world can follow that instruction without needing to know the particular parlance of how people work out there, without having, without having to know how to describe a hand clean in like, you know, in Chinese, like it's, it's all, you could just do it in any, you could do it anywhere. Asia is certainly a market players in the fitness industry want to crack. According to the Global Wellness Institute, Asia's physical activity market is worth 240 billion US dollars and will overtake North America by 2023. Why? It lies with the middle class. At the end of World War II, there was sort of a mass movement of like, um, of middle class job. People were sitting more during work rather than having labor jobs. The automobile was proliferating. People were all of a sudden more sedentary. And as soon as that happened, there was a need for sort of some sort of healthy activity outside of the work. There's proliferation of all kinds of fitness trends due to sort of the, the burgeoning of the middle class. And so fitness has just become this multi-billion dollar industry. With the numbers of people that Asia has and the increase in income and expansion of a middle class, you know, I don't think there's anything stopping Asia from taking over as a fitness giant. The market has definitely become more and more saturated. With F45s, I mean, we've gone from, at the time when I launched, six studios on the island to now there would be over 45 studios in Singapore. There is hardly an excuse not to exercise in Singapore. According to Run Repeat, there are over 200 gyms in Singapore to date, boasting 320,000 members. With so many gyms and so little time, HIT seems to be the holy grail of exercise today. There's HIT on trampolines, HIT on floats, HIT that wants you out in 30 minutes. This time-saving workout has got fitness players like Zumba, thinking if they too should get with the times. If you bought into fitness back in 2014, you'd be sporting some sort of wearable, leggings, yoga mat, tagging things like hashtag beast mode or hashtag leg day or fitspiration. And the movers and shakers were into HIT or high intensity interval training. 40 seconds on and 20 seconds off. Beto and I were walking through a trade show and we saw a class that said HIT to music. And Beto and I went in there and we took the class and Beto kept telling me during the class, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. I say, man, I had this idea. Batman, the TV series in the, in the 70s, when Batman punch and, and the, the letters come into the screen, pow, boom, pow, splash, something like that, but with music. The Albertos found a gap. A gap that could set their hit repertoire apart from the rest. They decided to give hit a makeover, and it has nothing to do with dance or Latin music. Zumba launched Strong Nation in 2016, where high-intensity movements are synced with music. We decided to reverse engineer the music. So first we create the moves, and then we give those moves, that video, to a DJ, a music producer, and we tell them, please score the music to the workout. And this is the first song that we created with Timbaland for Strong by Zumba. Zumba zoned in on creating their own workout music genre. Strong Nation launched alongside music partnerships with hit-making producers like Timbaland and Steve Aoki. And while Zumba is known for its moves, Music has been one of the company's core business. So weight loss and fitness was the business we thought we were getting into. Then 
we realized it was entertainment and we created the Zumba Music Lab to produce our own music and work with famous artists to co-produce. So we have artists uh, like J-Lo, Black Eyed Peas, Daddy Yankee, Shakira, and they all want to launch their music to the Zumba community because they know not only do we reach 15 million people, we reach 15 million people in 186 countries. Zumba is better than a radio station. You are creating synergies between um, the music and the movement, and you're writing on the brands of well-known personalities in the music industry. It provides um, the corporate entity uh, with a little uh, more diversification. Um, so they're not just reliant on the income stream or the cash flows from the local entrepreneurs. Over the past 10 years, Zumba has grown into a music empire. It has an in-house team of 10 producers and songwriters and has produced at least 10 top charting songs. And their new foray into sync to music sessions is working. Less than two years after Strong Nation launched, about 400,000 people are moving to music in more than 18,000 classes weekly. Strong Nation is growing faster than Zumba did in its first few years. But just as Zumba was going strong, a global pandemic brought the entire fitness industry to its knees. Gyms bore the weight of it. Fitness centers became COVID hotspots resulting in temporary shutdowns. I felt the lack of the endorphins. I felt the lack of the structure. I felt the lack of feeling like I was doing enough. I think for a lot of people, they did have to become their own PTs over lockdown. Remember how home fitness arrived in the 50s? Then hit a peak in the 70s with step aerobics? Well, the pandemic brought fitness back home again. The global at-home fitness market is expected to be worth $9.5 billion by 2021, a 40% increase from 2019. For brick and mortar studios like F45, it was a sink or swim scenario. Franchisees like Mel were forced to shutter studios for months. As a result, 2020 saw F45 incur an 11% decline in revenue, with its losses doubling. Several other corporate chains suffered a harsher fate, filing for bankruptcy protection or closure. It's been devastating. Within 48 hours, we had to pivot the business from being fully operational, conducting classes with 27 people in it, sweating all over each other, to um, moving online. I'm going to take you through an at-home hack that you can use with scuff. Okay, you are going to extend one arm. Come back in. We ran a session called Sweat and Connect, and we made that available to anyone for free. We maxed out our capacity on Zoom of people sweating and connecting, not just in Singapore, but all over the world. It's brought us together as a group of franchisees. We have WhatsApp groups, we have network calls with HQ around you know, ways to keep the community in Singapore as a whole um, going. Sales techniques, how do we get our members back into the studios, etc., etc. Due to shifting COVID restrictions, Mel has shut and opened her studio three times since March of 2020 to June of 2021. She's seen 65% of members return, and she expects more to return as capacity restrictions ease. And F45's bet on gyms bouncing back gets bigger. While the company has had two false starts going public, it made their Wall Street debut in July 2021. The goal? To raise 325 million US dollars in the IPO with the belief that investors will buy into their business model and bullish outlook. According to a leading industry association, the pandemic will cause a contraction of about 15.6 billion US dollars. In the US alone, 25% of the nation's 50,000 gyms 
will close their doors for good. Thankfully for companies like Zumba, their business model doesn't rely on the brick and mortar, but their instructors did. Our tech team had something called Zin Studio, Zoom Instructor Network Studio. And it was an app that allowed them to transmit their class. And around 75% of our instructors transitioned to virtual classes. It allowed us to give our instructors more options on where to teach and how to teach. According to Zumba, nearly one million people are taking virtual Zumba classes each week, filmed by instructors around the world. And it's not only because people wish to work out. We've received so many messages online of people who have started taking Zumba during the pandemic because of the mental health benefits. Mental health, I feel, is also a very big piece of our future. We have something important that we bring. Gyms around the world are on a rebound to reclaim their former role in our lives. And as we walk back into a changed fitness world, fitness players like Zumba and F45 will continue to be on a path to revive, reinvent, and reconnect. To come out with even more innovative, productive, and fun ways to reach greater health and mental well-being. I have seen post-pandemic this softening um, in ways. There's a lot less, you know, Nike just do it, slogans that are really kind of brutalistic or disciplined. I think we're returning to this more holistic understanding of what a fit person is, what a healthy person is, and what a well person is. We'll see what new trends emerge from that trajectory.